Hi, and welcome back to my videos for Physical Chemistry 1. Today I want to continue our discussion of how entropy, energy, and enthalpy are all related to one another. In the last video, we looked at how the entropy and energy are connected for systems at a constant temperature and volume. Today I want to look at another much more common situation, a system whose temperature and pressure are constant. Just like last time, we're not assuming that our system is isolated. In other words, the system and the surroundings are in contact, so it's possible that energy might be entering or leaving the system. That's different than the situation we've had in most of our earlier videos, in which we've been looking at isolated systems. Just as in the last video, one thing we're interested in is whether or not a non-isolated chemical reaction will take place spontaneously. We'll start by thinking about the first law of thermodynamics. We know that the work is equal to the negative of the pressure times the change in volume. How can we connect this to the entropy of a process? Well, the second law of thermodynamics tells us that the entropy is always greater than or equal to the heat divided by T. If we rearrange this equation a little, we have this, and we can substitute this inequality into our expression for du to get this equation. So this tells us that du is always less than or equal to T ds minus P dv. It's important to keep in mind that this is true for a system where the pressure and temperature are constant. With that in mind, let's remember that the two sides of the original inequality we used is equal for a process at equilibrium and greater than for a spontaneous process. In the same way, the less than inequality is correct for the spontaneous processes. Let's move the TDS and PDV terms to the left side of this expression. We can group the three terms together this way. The reason to do that is because, written this way, the equation is telling us that for a spontaneous process, the change in U minus TS plus PV will be less than zero, so it's a negative number. In other words, a process like a chemical reaction will be spontaneous if the change in U minus TS plus P times V is a negative number, and it will be zero if the reaction is the equilibrium. This is such a useful result that the term in parentheses gets its own symbol and its own name. It's called the Gibbs free energy in honor of the person who first recognized its importance, Josiah Gibbs, and it has a symbol capital G. We've talked about Gibbs before back in video 21 because it was Gibbs who first defined the entropy as the reversible heat exchange divided by the temperature. And we've seen in the past several videos that this is an especially useful way of defining the entropy. As we saw a moment ago, the change in the Gibbs free energy must be less than zero for a spontaneous process and equal to zero for a process at equilibrium. That also means that a reversible chemical reaction will start out with a negative value for delta G and it will slowly increase until it reaches zero, at which the point the reaction will be at equilibrium. Notice that if delta G is greater than zero, that doesn't mean the reaction is impossible, just that it isn't spontaneous. If we want such a reaction to occur, it'll be necessary to add energy to the system. Also, notice that based on our definition of the Gibbs free energy, delta G is equal to this. That means that delta U minus T delta S plus P delta V is less than zero for a spontaneous process. Notice that this equation is somewhat more complicated than the similar equation we derived for the Helmholtz free energy in, in the previous video. It would be nice if we could simplify this equation a little. And it turns out that we can do that by using an expression we got all the way back in video 16. Back then, we saw that the change in energy during a chemical reaction is equal to the change in enthalpy minus P delta V. If we substitute that into our expression for the Gibbs free energy, we get this equation. Notice that the P delta V terms will cancel out, which leaves us with this expression for the Gibbs free energy. Chances are this might look familiar to you. 
This expression for delta G is one that you probably learned in your general chemistry course. Let's see what we can do with this equation. Earlier, we said that delta G is always less than or equal to zero for a spontaneous process, and it turns out that this has some interesting consequences. For example, consider this reaction, where acetylene reacts with hydrogen to produce the gas ethane. What would be the Gibbs free energy of this process at 25 degrees Celsius? To find out, we just need to think carefully about how to use the equation we derived. We need to know delta H and delta S. To get these, we'll need to look up data in an appendix or in a reference book. As you might recall, we can calculate the changes in enthalpy and entropy using these equations. When we do, we find out that delta H for this reaction is negative 311.38 kilojoules, and delta S is negative 232.6 joules per kelvin. Notice what this data is telling us. First of all, enthalpy change is a negative number, which means that this is an exothermic reaction. Also, notice the entropy is also a negative number. That makes sense because we're starting with two compounds, but the product consists of only one. But wait, this reaction happened spontaneously, and we know that for a spontaneous process, the entropy change should be a positive number. How is this possible? Well, back in video 26, you might recall that we saw that the entropy change of a spontaneous process is always positive for a closed system. However, this is not a closed system, so the process can be spontaneous even though the entropy of the system decreases. So, now we'll plug that data into our expression for delta G. Don't forget, we need to convert the temperature into Kelvin. Also, the enthalpy and entropy need to incorporate the same energy units. For that reason, let's convert the enthalpy into units of joules. When we do, we find out that the Gibbs free energy is equal to negative 242,030 joules. So, the Gibbs free energy for this reaction is a negative number, which means it's a spontaneous process. Now, let's look at this equation a little more closely. Think about what will happen as we raise the temperature. Since s is a negative number, we're subtracting a negative number in this term of the equation. That means that, as the temperature increases, the overall Gibbs free energy becomes more positive. So, as the temperature rises, the reaction becomes less spontaneous. Eventually, if the temperature becomes high enough, delta G will become a positive number, and at that point the reaction will not be spontaneous anymore. Let's figure out the temperature at which that will happen. To do so, we'll use this equation again. We're trying to determine the temperature at which the reaction switches from being spontaneous to non-spontaneous. At that temperature, the Gibbs free energy goes from being negative to positive, so delta G is exactly zero at that temperature. If we plug in our values for the enthalpy and entropy, we can now solve for the temperature. When we do, we find that T is equal to 1,339 Kelvin. So below that temperature, the reaction is expected to be spontaneous, and above that temperature, it won't be. Instead, at those higher temperatures, it's the reverse reaction that's spontaneous. But wait, actually, although we've used this equation properly, we've actually forgotten to perform an important step that we learned about in some earlier videos. As you might remember, the data in the appendix we used in order to determine the enthalpy and entropy were collected at a temperature of 25 Celsius. But at other temperatures, the enthalpy and entropy could be very different. For that reason, we need to account for the change in enthalpy and entropy when we attempt to solve this problem. As you might recall from video 19, the change in enthalpy with temperature is given by this equation. And in video 21, we saw that the change in entropy is given by this equation. So, what we need to do is use these two new expressions for the enthalpy and entropy in our overall calculation. 
when we do, we get this large expression. This is a much more complicated equation than the one that we used earlier, but we can still solve it to determine the value of t, where the Gibbs free energy changes from being negative to positive. First, we'll insert 0 for delta g, and the values we already know for the enthalpy and entropy at 25 Celsius. Next, remember that delta t is just the change in temperature, so we can rewrite that as t minus 298.15 Kelvin. Also, in this part of the equation, the final temperature is t, and the initial temperature is 298.15. Next, let's rewrite the logarithm a bit. As you might know, the logarithm of a fraction is just equal to the log of the numerator minus the log of the denominator. Finally, we need to know delta Cp, the change in the heat capacity that occurs during the reaction. If we look up the heat capacities of the reactants and products, here's what we get. To get delta Cp, we just need to subtract the heat capacities of the reactants from the products. Notice that the units for the heat capacity is joules per Kelvin mole, so we need to account for the number of moles of each compound, which we get from the coefficients in the balanced reaction. When we perform this calculation, we find that the change in heat capacity is 49.18 joules per Kelvin. We'll plug that data into our overall equation. Now we only have one unknown left, the temperature, which is what we're trying to determine. This is a complex calculation, so let's do it in small steps. First, we'll move the enthalpy part of the equation to the left side of the equal sign. Next, let's distribute the factor of 49.18 in the two places where it occurs in the equation. Now, we'll combine the two constants on the left side, and also the two constants on the right side. Next, we'll distribute the factor t on the right side. We'll move the term containing t on the left side of the equation to the right, and combine it with this term on the right side. Finally, we'll factor out t from the terms on the right, which finally gives us this equation. Unfortunately, it isn't easy to directly solve this equation for t, but we can do it graphically. If we use a program like Excel, we can make a plot of this expression for the different values of t and plot the result. When we do, we find out that the line crosses the horizontal where delta g equals 0 when t is about 1181 Kelvin. So, delta g switches from being a negative to a positive number at 1181k. Notice that this is significantly different from the value we got when we didn't account for the changes in enthalpy and entropy with temperature. Back when we did it that way, we got 1339 Kelvin, much different from our new, more exact calculation. That demonstrates an important thing to keep in mind. It'll be very important to account for the change in enthalpy and entropy when performing calculations at a temperature other than 25 Celsius. Let's try one more example. Suppose we wanted to know the Gibbs free energy of the reaction at a temperature of 700 K. How would we do it? Once again, we'd use this equation. And once again, we'd need to account for the change in enthalpy and entropy at the different temperature. However, this will be an easier calculation than the last one, because we know the final temperature this time. Our unknown isn't t, it's delta g. So, we'll plug in the values for the final temperature, 700 K. We already know all the data we need. We've determined delta H and delta S at 298.15 Kelvin, and we also determined delta Cp. The term with a logarithm in it is equal to 41.97 joules per Kelvin. Now the second term in the enthalpy part of the calculation is equal to 19,763 joules, and the entropy term is equal to 192,199 joules. Now that we know that, we can calculate the Gibbs free energy, which is negative 138,944 joules.
So, now we have a fairly good handle on how the change in free energy of a reaction is calculated. However, so far we've only determined properties like delta G, delta S, or delta H over a range of temperatures by calculating the change in heat capacity. But for many compounds, heat capacity data isn't always available, and for some compounds the change in heat capacity may be difficult to measure experimentally. How can we determine these properties when the heat capacities aren't known? Fortunately, there is a way we can do it, and it's a technique that even works when we're not keeping the pressure or volume constant as we've been doing for the past few videos. That's something we'll spend the next video talking about. But we've already covered plenty of new material today, so we'll stop for now. I hope you'll join me for the next talk as we delve even deeper into the mathematics behind the thermodynamic properties we've been talking about. But until then, have a good week.